Hey, I've met lots of people who think research is boring. They just want to take a brief and jump straight into sketching ideas. But in product design, gaining insight into how people use products helps you add value to your designs, which makes your designs better, your portfolio better, and increases your chances of getting a job in design. So this episode is all about research. Research is a massive subject, and you can go really deep with it, much deeper than I can fit into a short YouTube video. So this is just a jumping off point. I've also put good links in the description for you to investigate. Why research? Well, we research so we don't always end up designing things for ourselves. Once you pass the brief, everything in product design becomes about stories. Listening to people's stories, interpreting their stories, and telling your own story and a version of theirs through the products that you design. It's all about stories. And people like telling you their stories. If you ask and they're not getting on with the product, they're usually only too happy to tell you about it. The design process is often split into phases. In university, this is so that you can be evaluated and scored on how well you complete each phase. And when employed as a designer, it's so that a job can be more accurately costed by apportioning time to each stage. What can happen is that the company employing you to deliver the project has an immovable deadline for product launch because of a big trade show that they must be out with their new product. Otherwise, their competitors will get all their orders and it would be a disaster. As a designer, you build up a pretty good idea of how long things will take, depending on the complexity of the product. The manufacturers have told you how long they will need to create the tool. You know how much time you need for CAD and how long the prototypes will take to test. So working backwards with an aggressive timescale, it's hard to reduce the end things like tool manufacture. It's usually the front end stuff like research that gets the squeeze, which is a real shame because what happens at the start of a project affects the outcome. Preparing a Gantt chart like this for every project helps you to not miss a deadline. Now it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that research is a phase that happens at the start of a project and ends as soon as you start sketching concepts. This isn't true. Rather than look like this, your project actually looks a bit like this. The main concentration of research effort is at the start of the project, but you are constantly doing research and testing throughout the project to move you forward from beginning to production. At the start of the project, research concentrates on identifying problems, confirming or dismissing assumptions, and then investigating theories. Then later on, research becomes more focused on problem solving, researching mechanisms, proving ideas, investigating materials and manufacturing methods. You often see queries on design forums like Core 77, asking what is the most important skill a designer should have. And lots of people will answer sketching or CAD, which are really important skills. But for me, top of the list would be listening, observing, and interpreting. With each project, once you've identified your target audience, you have to try and understand them, to walk a mile in their shoes in as fast a time as possible. Not just their struggles, but their motivations, their desires, and their preferences. Many years ago, lots of research was put into making aids to help people experience what life was like for an elderly person or someone overweight. People made suits that were heavy or restricted your movement, glasses that limited your vision, and gloves that weakened your grip strength. It's easy to mimic many of these aids with a few simple household items and bits and pieces, but whilst these aids may help you get an insight into what life is like, they don't convey pain or what it's like to struggle every day of every week. If you just researched with these aids, you'd miss out on so many elements that you can only discover simply by listening and observing, then making and repeating with your design. This is what's missing from so many student projects. Get out with a camera and collect first source data to inform your design, but then go the extra mile. Put prototypes that you've made into people's hands and watch how they use them. Then make further improvements and repeat over and over. Really push it as far as you can in the time allowed. I'm as guilty of not doing this as everyone else, but I see lots of student work that I know wouldn't work well, if at all. Even if it is a beautiful CAD rendering, I can tell they haven't researched and made and tested a physical model. Designs tell stories, and their purpose is to become real products that people use. With the pressures of making your portfolio look good, the risk is you jump to the beautiful CAD rendering without doing the hard yards. To the general public, most of them won't be able to tell the difference. But to product designers, the people who might employ you, this stuff stands out a mile. You can tell who has really thought about the product's use and who hasn't. 
what is impossible to manufacture, what would be uncomfortable to hold, uh, what wouldn't work. No one wants their products to tell this sort of story. So putting beautiful renderings of unmade and untested work in your portfolio demonstrates you can use CAD, but not much more. So get out and talk to people, starting with family and friends. A simple example of this is my nan in her kitchen. One statement that she couldn't stand for any length of time, so could no longer cook safely, totally changed the way I looked at kitchens and led me to a new kitchen design that adapts to its user and is designed to be safer. Recently, I was talking to her about her TV remote control. When I was 80, I broke my wrist. I fell in Meadow Hall and broke my wrist, which had in plaster for a while, but they didn't get the plaster on right at good at the time and so I got pins and needles in my fingers badly and so they had to take the plaster off early. Consequently I can't grip anything so when I'm wanting to do anything like that um, this hand really is of very little use. Well you need two hands with the bat the thing to go in that hand to hold it and then if I'm shaking a bit, you need to pull the, the battery, top, cover. The ca battery cover off. The older we get, the more problems we encounter with a whole range of things. A TV can be someone's main entertainment. It's their window on the world. So to not consider all its aspects of use means the designer unwittingly builds in barriers to its use. This is crazy. You can't just focus on one element or the main purpose of the design. Your approach and research to identify areas to improve has to be holistic. A TV remote that the user can't change the batteries on becomes a negative experience and a loss of independence as you then have to rely on someone else's help. In the past, I've been involved in focus groups to find out how people struggled with products. Running focus groups and keeping conversations focused on the product in the right way is a skill and focus groups are a great way to identify problems and avenues to explore. But just remember, if you are sat around a table discussing a product without observing how it's used in its typical setting, you are missing out on half the story, where people store it and how they clean it. It's like taking a train ride and only looking out of one window, you're only going to see half the world. So I think the key is observing people using a product in that product's familiar environment whilst getting much more depth by asking questions. Open questions are the who, what, where types of questions. What do you find hard about using this product? Closed questions are when you want a specific answer. How often do you need to replace the batteries? There is an art to asking questions. There are many ways to ask the same question and how you ask can affect the answer you get. I used to work in a college and teenagers were forever coming into the office because they'd lost their timetable. All they'd say was, I, uh, I don't know where I need to go. Their question forces the person dealing with them, me, to have to ask them more questions to be able to help. What they should have said was something like, my name is Product Tank, I've lost my timetable, please would you tell me where Mr D sign is teaching now. This is giving helpful pieces of information first before asking for the answer you want. Imagine if you were asking for a job. You wouldn't just say, give me a job. You'd say, hi, I'm a product design student. I'm good at sketching ideas. I don't mind helping around the office and I make a great cup of tea. Please could I intern with you? So in one sentence, you have shown benefit, shown benefit and asked your question or give, give, ask. But with research, give, give, ask can easily be a leading or loaded question. It's important that they tell you, not you tell them the benefits and ask if they agree. I've heard most people struggle to change the batteries in this device. Don't you agree? Is leading. Have you ever changed the batteries? Can you show me? How did you find that? Will elicit a much more honest response. So don't wing it. Prepare your questions. Put the product in their hands. Watch them using it. And then ask questions based on what you see. Give people enough space and time to tell you their story. Still pretty nimble fingered. Well, hands are not, my left hand's a nuisance because it won't hold anything. For many of the problems that your research throws up, you may find yourself encountering what you feel are the same two solutions to problems over and over again. 
Option one, a solution to the problem already exists, just the person doesn't know about it. For example, someone I know um, was struggling to use their tin opener and they didn't realize they could buy an electric hands-free one. Option two, the solution is more service-based. A family friend struggles to chop vegetables, but rather than design a clever mechanism that makes chopping vegetables easier, she can just buy packets of pre-cut vegetables. It would be easy, if you come across these problems, to think that there's nothing you can do. That's not true. We are the most adaptable species on the planet, but we're not going to evolve new appendages anytime soon. So what we've become amazingly adept at is creating tools, and often, when a tool creates a problem, we design another tool solution. We create a tool to help us solve the problem created by another tool. For the person struggling with their tin opener, buying an electric version is certainly the best short-term answer, but rather than what at first glance is a closed-off avenue of research, the tin opener problem has opened up three avenues, improving the standard tin opener, improving the electric one, it still needs batteries, and trying to redesign the tin or some form of packaging. A few pointers. Make time to get out there and talk to people. It's one of the things all designers don't do enough. Don't design in isolation by just taking the brief and starting to sketch ideas. Use the insight people give you to add value to your designs. It will improve the design, which in university should get you higher marks and make your portfolio better, so increase the chances of you getting a job. Prepare so that you can get the answers you need, not the answers you want or have assumed before your research. Know when and why you're asking open and closed questions and avoid leading or loaded questions. If you observe how a product is used outside of its typical setting, you are missing out on half the story. Nothing beats watching and questioning your target audience in person in a setting they are comfortable with and a setting where the product you are redesigning is commonly used. Be prepared to change your mind. As designers, never assume other people think like you. The older I get, the more I discover people don't think like me at all. Finally, don't waste your research. Sometimes I use my knowledge of the people I have researched to add a twist to a project they are not the target market for. As an example, this is Colin. Colin's an ex-rugby player who likes ordering things online. He doesn't like walking around the shops because of his hips and he will rarely answer the door. Say I'm designing a coffee table and I'm looking for inspiration. I'll use Colin or Maxine or Shirley or my nan and try and create one to their needs to see what new ideas this method could bring. So a mail order coffee table can be posted through a letterbox to save Colin answering the door and constructed with no tools and limited dexterity with a leopard skin print option. It's an interesting design challenge. Or say I'm designing a vacuum cleaner. Now, as you know, my nan can't stand for any length of time and has bad balance so can no longer do the vacuuming. Uh oh, option one alert. Why not just get her a robot vacuum cleaner? Well, I could, but it's for getting crumbs off the sofa, and just like her, it can't manage the stairs. It's time to get my thinking cap on. This may or may not help you, but hopefully it's food for thought. I hope you enjoyed this episode. In the next episode, I'm looking at sketching.